Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Inio Siberio from Northeast Brazil. Dr. Inio is from SAP Brazil and is an orthopedic surgeon specialized in shoulder surgery. He got his training and obtained his qualification in shoulder surgery from the La Main Institute in Paris, France, and also from the Federal University of Pernambuco Clinics Hospital. He mainly performs arthroscopic surgeries of the shoulder and also shoulder arthroplasty. He's a preceptor at the Orthopedics Medical Residency at the Otavio de Freitas Hospital at SFE. He's also a member of the Brazilian Society of Shoulder and Elbow. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Inio Sibirio from Brazil. Over to you, Inio. Thank you. First of all, I, I'd like to thank Dr. Hitesh for his invitation. For me, it's an honor to be here and briefly share our practice with you. But let me introduce myself. My name is Andy Silberio, and I'm from Recife, Northeast part of Brazil. Today, we are going to talk about local posterior dislocation of the shoulder. It is defining as a complete loss of articular surface, which requires a reduction maneuver. To this date, no standard definition has been accepted to determine a chronic condition. For example, authors' opinions differ regarding the amount of time after the traumas occurred. It varies from 24 hours up to several months. However, Three weeks is the most accepted. Hippocrates, in 460 BC, already spoke of shoulder dislocation. In 1832, Cooper described the posterior dislocation for the fifth time, McLaughlin. In 1952, described, described uh, the subscapular transfer technique. Near published the transfer of the minor tuberosity in 1987. We've made a lot of progress in terms of shoulder surgery. With the advent of technology, we started to perform it with small incisions using the arthroscope. But in the case of inveterated posterior dislocation, we still do open surgery. The technique I prefer to use is based on the article published by McLaughlin in the BDS in 1952, which transferred the subscapularis to the reverse heel sac lesion. I've been using this technique for the past 20 years in my, most of my patients. It is very important to know the shoulder surface anatomy to identify the exact location of important structures. Besides know the arthroscopic anatomy, it is also important to know the principles of open surgery and to be especially careful with the neurovascular structures. First of all, it is important to know the term instability, which refers to a functional acquired unilateral symptom. A small percentage of young patients subluxate the shoulder voluntarily, usually in the posterior direction, because the posterior capsule is less resistant than the anterior, which is a sign of instability without traumatic onset. In cases of traumatism, hyperlax is an instability risk factor. When we decide to treat patients, it is essential to be able to identify the different types of injuries. Labral injuries to the glenoid, humeral, capsule, bone lesions at the edge of, of the glenoid, fracture by impaction of the humeral side called reverse heel injury. Recent studies 
have demonstrated that this injury is presented in 65% of the cases. Fractures of the humeral neck and tuberosis are present around 50% of the patients. Neurological and vascular lesions can be present. The rotator cuff injuries and biceps lesions are less frequently, which can be interposed to prevent reduction. Why should the dislocation are quite frequently? Posterior dislocation are rare, representing 2% of shoulder dislocation. This infrequency means that over 50% of the cases are not diagnosed at the fifth time on the medical consultation. It occurs more frequently in men than in women. Ratio is 2 to 1, and it's more frequent in the adult population. Most dislocations, 67%, were produced by a traumatic accident, with most of the remainder produced by seizure. During seizure, shoulder dislocates posterior more, more frequent because the internal rotation muscles are stronger than the external rotation, rotator. Pain is an important feature to be observed. In chronic cases, it can be mild. Joint block is frequently. The doctor must be attended in order to give a differential diagnosis, as it may look like frozen shoulder. During physical examination, the appearance of the shoulder may look like normal. The coracoid process may be prominent with flattening of the anterior aspect of the shoulder and posterior prominence. Inability to supinate the palm when extending the arm, as described by whole anxiety, is very frequent observed. Limited shoulder mobility is important, especially limited external rotation. We routinely use X-ray in a view which shows the loss of joint contours and axillary view, which is the best position to make a diagnosis and quantify the bone damage. Tomography is a reliable method. Normally, we use reconstruction 3D and axillary view. There are several classifications. One of them is anatomical. There is another classification that determines the percentage of involvement of the reverse maxillary lesion. Less than 20% from 20 to 50 and above 50%. There are another described by Handel in 40 in four types. Type 1 consists of a compressive, compressive fracture involved less than 50% of the head. Type 2, when the maxillary lesion is more than 50%. Type 3 represents the fracture in two parts, and type 4 consists of multiple fragments. The most important thing is to get to know our patient well in order to choose the best treatment. We need to take into consideration if he is an active young patient or if he is collaborative or if he is an elderly patient with comorbidities. When the patient has epilepsy, it needs to be under control before surgery. After analyzing the time when the dislocated occur and the payment of the associated injuries, we make our plan and decide on the best technique to use. In addition to the surgeon experience and preference, we have several possibilities, each one with specific details. 
A tropa is indicated in more several cases with the humeral head very compromised and in more than 60 months of evolution. In specific cases of elderly patients without major complaints and health problems, we can opt for conservative treatment. In our routine, we use the MacLock technique more frequently, more frequently. In general, in lesions of less than 20% of humeral head involvement, we try close reduction and sometimes open reduction. In cases of injuries between 20 and 45% of involvement, we do MacLock above 50% we indicate atropa. It is important to remember that we usually try on injuries with up to three weeks of evolution. When we do close reduction, the eye is slight internal rotation tends to dislocate again. So we mobilize it at 20 degrees of external rotation for one month. Posterior capsule and the labrum are elongated and detached, but posterior cuff tendon are usually intact. Anterior structures like subscapular and capsule are systematically retracted. Extensive fibrosis is always present. Among the techniques for transfer the subscapular tendon, we have McLaughlin and Spencer which makes a longitudinal incision without detach the subscapular tendon. To perform the McLaughlin surgery, we started with the anterior deltopatoral approach with severe hemostasis, proceeded with the release of the subscapular tendon. As the normal anatomy of the shoulder is altered, it is important to pay special attention to the axillary nerve that is close to the capsule. With the release of the joint capsule and fibrosis, it is possible to visualize the joint surface. Normally, with the help of a retractor, we, with gentle maneuvers, so as not to damage the articular surface, we reduce the humeral head, and after preparing the reverse heel sac lesion, we, we transfer the subscapular and pull out sutures in the humeral cortex. We don't use the anchors and we mobilize the shoulder for six weeks. There are other techniques described. Near modified the McLaughlin technique and incorporated the smaller tuberosity. This technique has the advantage of allowing better coverage of the bony lesion and better fixation. On the other hand, it is not easy to identify the exact location of the osteotomy. There are other techniques, such as double set, which uses the posterior offset, and the technique described by Gerber, which uses graft. Before I finish my presentation, uh, I'd like to show you some cases. This is a 60 year old patient. She had a big reverse heel sac lesion. McLaughlin surgery was performed. Immobilization in external rotation has been placed at 20 degrees and it was kept for six weeks. Then she had physical therapy for six months. This is a case of a 34 year old patient. It is important to pay attention. <coughs> as the X-ray image sometimes appears to be normal, and an image in the axillary position facilitates the diagnosis. Another similar case, but this patient had epilepsy. Appropriate surgery counter is necessary for successful surgery. Another patient with chronic posterior dislocation this patient had a dislocation fracture, type 3 of Handeli. We performed a reduction and fixation of the fragments with a suture. This patient here with a type 3 Handeli lesion, with the image defined 
the diagnosed well, we decided to reduce and fix it with plate and scroll. Another patient, this patient had a handle type for dislocation fracture. We decided on partial arthroplasty, an arthroplasty, and he had a good evolution. It is important to be aware that complications may be happen. This patient was open and developing arthrosis. Then, total arthroplasty was indicated. It's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Enio, for that uh, brilliant presentation of yours. Uh, it was a wonderful demonstration of your surgical technique.